dig in. Oh, hi. I'm Jonathan. Uh, I'm originally from England. I've been wandering around Europe for the last while. Uh, not only saying the UK isn't in Europe, or, uh, let's not go there. But anyway, um, so I live in Sweden these days. Um, I hack on the Pulse X project, particularly the Rakuda compiler. And in this talk today, I want to share with you some stuff that I've been doing over the last uh, kind of few months. So, first, a little bit of background, what is Rakuto? So, just for a show of hands, who's actually played with Rakuto before? Okay, who's submitted books in Rakuto? Okay, Carl, you should have two hands up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, unlike with Perl 5, with Perl 6, we separate out language and implementation. Um, so, Rakuto is one of the Perl 6 implementations, and it does. Um, it's one that I've been working on and contributing to for a little while. And it's pretty active, so I, I pulled up the statistic for October when I was preparing this talk, and uh, we had 242 commits by 10 different people. And that's just people with commit bits. There were some patches coming in from elsewhere, which we were applying as well. Uh, and uh, there is a script that if I could have got it to run, would have told me all about that, but it was passionate when it was going so. <laughs> so before we can talk about optimizing Rakuto and the Rakuto optimizer, we need to talk a little bit about how it actually runs your code. So you take your program and you say to Rakuto, here you are, please run this. And it kind of looks at it and it passes it and it builds two things. It builds something we call an abstract syntax tree, an AST. And it builds another thingy that we call a world. Now these capture, good morning, different aspects of the program. The AST captures the executable aspects, the things that your program does as it runs. The world captures all the declarative stuff, things like classes, subroutines, signatures, and so forth. Because we want all of these things available at compile time. Now, at that point, we then transform this into some kind of lower level AST that's much closer to the virtual machine. We turn it into something we'll run on a VM. And at this point, we've got sort of executable code of some form. Um, but the thing is that we compiled a bunch of subroutines up here. And they really should end up pointing down at the sort of virtual machine level code. So we do a few fix ups, um, which is not that much work really. And then we run your program. And if we're in sort of a pre-compiled setting, um, then we actually have sort of built this already, um, and we just sort of do the fix-ups and get running. So that's how we run programs, um, and that's kind of worth knowing, because there's, there's sort of a, a point in here where we're going to introduce an optimizer later. So that's sort of how it looks from an operational view, but how is it actually architected and structured on the inside? Well, when people come along and they say, what's Rakuto written in, uh, then the answer is stuff, uh, including NQP, which is a, it's not quite Perl6. Uh, it's actually a very minimal, small subset of the Perl6 language. And because it's much more constrained and restricted, we can make loads more assumptions, which means we can optimize it pretty nicely. There's Perl6 itself. So we write parts of Perl6 in Perl6, um, just to mess with your head. Uh, we have some VM specific code and we always run on some kind of runtime environment because Perl 6 has pretty demanding needs in that sense. So, in terms of the whole ecosystem, actually Rakuto is this sort of box up in the corner. And uh, you'll see that most of Rakuto is actually written in NQP, in this sort of subset of Perl 6. We don't try and make Rakuto sort of a fully self hosting compiler. Um, trying to do that for all of Perl 6 is kind of be kind of painful. Um, so we, we sort of say, well, we'll bootstrap at a different level and we'll, we'll sort of do it like this. So the bit that is written in Perl 6 is the core setting. That is the actual built-ins. So things like join, map, the addition operator, things like that. So we're building this in NQP and then your question is, well, what's NQP written in? And the answer is, it's written in NQP. It's bootstrapped. It knows how to compile itself. Um, and actually, that's pretty nice when it comes to things like porting, because to port NQP to a different backend, you just sort of get the, the code generation ported, and then you get it to spit itself out for another backend, which sounds trivial, but it's actually quite hard. 
Um, so that's kind of how we, we have that. And then we sort of have this layer which, so the original plan was what well, we run on Parrot, but these days we, we look at other VMs as well. So we have this sort of almost abstraction layer. One part is this abstract syntax tree format. Another chunk is this VD called six model, which is essentially where the sort of object system bottoms out. So if you look at uh, these two up here, you see they have written meta objects. Your meta objects are the things that say how is a class implemented, how is a role implemented, uh, what does it mean to be a subroutine, and so forth. So you'll see that we have to implement those in something. Well, the recruiter ones are inter implemented in terms of NQP's ones, but somewhere this has to bottom out, right? If there's a class which says what the class means, then what says what the class that says what the class means means? Um, well, that's something else. And the answer is, it's a very primitive, objecty thing that down here in uh, this thing they call signal. And then we have a bunch of ops, and then down here uh, we have all the specific stuff. So this is the sort of chunk of code gen for a VM called Parrot. And we have some active work at the moment on the CLR. Um, and somebody recently started getting us to run on LuaJIT, which is a kind of interesting effort that I've been following quite closely. So that's kind of what it all looks like. And you'll notice some sort of structure in there as well. So for each of Recruit and NQP, I talked about the measure objects. The grammar is the thing that declares the language syntax. The action says, how do I get from syntax, for example, the keyword for, into something I can actually execute? And it turns out a for loop really in POSIX is just a call to map. Um, so that just transforms into a method call. So that's the overall architecture. And the question is, well, where do we optimize? And well, you can do lots of things, right? You can optimize the compiler itself. You can optimize the setting, the built-ins. You can optimize NQP, which in turn sort of helps Rakudo because that's what it's written in, in a large part. You can optimize the low-level bits, um, and then you can actually take the program the user has given you and transform it into a better program so it can run faster. And which are we doing? Well, we're doing all of them, of course. So the first half of the talk, I want to focus on the things we're doing to optimize the compiler itself and its built-ins. In the second half, I'm going to talk about something called the optimizer, which is the thing that takes your program and tries to generate a better one. So the overall theme of a lot of what I, so you find when you start working on this is that you always profile. If you want to know whether code is you know, slow or why code is slow, guessing doesn't tend to work out very well. You actually have to run it through some kind of profiling, get some information from it, and then you know, okay, this is the area where it's not running so fast. It can be quite surprising. Now, we profile at two different levels. One of them is VM level profiling. So this is profiling at quite a low level. Uh, it may involve profiling the virtual machine itself, so when we're talking about Recruiter running on Parrot, the way I look at this is I grab the C profiler and I sort of feed the whole thing through that. And that gives me a pretty good idea of sort of the low level primitives and what we're spending time on. Um, it may also involve profiling the layer above that. So on the CLR, uh, when I was doing all the sort of six model core work there, I could sort of grab the, uh, the profiler for that and again profile at that lower level. So it can tell us about what primitives we're getting tied up in. It can tell us if we're spending a lot of time doing object allocation, if we're spending a lot of time doing garbage collection, if we're spending a lot of time looking at lexicals. Uh, so we can get this idea of the low level things that are going on in our program. So just as an example, uh, so if I actually took the slowest running specification test, and this, this does hundreds and hundreds of, of regexes in here, it's, it's a huge test file, and actually running the tests is pretty fast. Compiling the tests is what takes ages. And it's like, well, why on earth is it taking so long? Um, and when I took a look at it, I realized that it was spending 23% of its time doing register allocation. 
Um, that's a pretty low level operation where it sort of says how do I best sort of allocate registers um, in the VM for this sort of chunk of code. And yeah, we should not, I mean, this should be sort of a, a, a percent of most of runtime. It should not be 23%. And the tools are quite nice. This is the Visual Studio uh, C profiler. And I can dig down into sort of figuring out where we're spending time. Um, and it turned out in this case that actually um, we're spending a lot of time partly because the register allocation could be better, but also because we're not generating as good code as we probably should be. When I looked at the code that was causing this, I looked at it and said, oh, we could do much better. So you can sort of see, well, that's a big pain point, therefore I should spend time on it. In another story, um, I was profiling compilation of Rakuto set. This is the sort of built-in things that we have, and it's pretty big. When you take it all as one, it's about 7,000 lines of code, something like that. It's pretty sizable. Um, and as I was looking at the profile, I kept seeing that we were spending a lot of time in garbage collection, which is not so good a sign, but when I looked deeper, I realized we were spending 20% of the time in one very small, or in theory, small task that it has to do. Um, actually, stack scanning, which I don't want really to go into now, um, but basically it just should not be that slow. And what we found was that there was a really inefficient algorithm that was saying, is this finger pointer or not? Um, and once we sort of realized what was going on, uh, the problem was that actually it was, it had, so your, your memory's broken up into a load of pages. And we had a linked list of these, and it was basically walking through this linked list and stomping all over memory. If you have a set associative cache in your CPU, this is a really, really bad thing to do. Um, so on my machine, this was 20%. On another guy's, it almost doubled the performance because he must have been hitting this pathological case with the CPU cache. Um, so, yeah, we got a, a about a 50 line percent, ah, a 50 line patch gave sort of a 20 percent performance improvement. Back. So obviously this helps. We've managed to find a bunch of things, but it tells you things at a pretty low level. And at some sort of point, you realize that every program is made out of primitives. They're all made up of doing memory allocations. Uh, doing dispatches, calling subroutines, looking at variables, and so forth. And really, we kind of need something higher level in a lot of situations. So this is where we start profiling at the Perl 6 and NQP level. How do we do this? Well, the place we do this at the moment is actually on Parrot. There's a sub-level profiler which tells us how much time we're spending in each subroutine. And it can do the inclusive and exclusive stuff. And it produces output for a program called kcashgrind. Has anybody ever used this? Yeah, kcashgrind is really nice. Um, so it gives you a really good way of browsing through your profiling information and seeing what the nerf's going on and where you're spending the time. So just to take an example of a program I was trying to figure out a while, while ago, this, is, uh, this was running very slowly for some reason. And basically, it, that's just the range up there. Um, actually, it doesn't go and fully expand that range here in Perl 6 because it's a lazy list. Um, same for the one below. And this X operator is called the cross. It gives you every permutation of the things on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. So the output of this is going to be something like AA1, AA2, all the way up to ZZ100. Um, so it's about a 67,000 element list that is producing, which really is not big at all um, in the grand scheme of things. So I was looking at this and saying, well, what's the slow thing here? And your first instinct might be, well, it's probably something in computing the permutations. Um, and then I went and actually looked at the profile and said, it's spending about 35% of its time calling the same method. Heck, this is not good. I mean, we shouldn't be spending 35% of the time doing I.O. in this program. So then I looked, went further and I found that it was spending most of the time in print on the file handle. So file handles are objects, that's just a standard out one. Um, and it was spending a load of time there. 
And then when I look at the code, the code looked like this. This is the print method on an I.O. handle. That PIO thing there is the low-level I.O. object, which is sort of the VM level doing our I.O. And we're calling print on it. We are sort of unboxing this string. But when I looked at this, what you realize is it takes a list. So every time, even if we just pass in one string, it has to create the list. It then has to sort of give me the first item to make sure that there's something in there. It then shifts it off that list. It stringifies it, and it prints it. Well, you know, that's quite a lot of work. I mean, we can print a pretty string. So here's what we do. We just say, I turn this into a multi-method. A multi-method is something where you have the same name, but different signatures. And you'll see up there, I've just said, this is a string, it's defined, it's not the type object, and it's got a value, and then I just unbox it uh, and print it. So that's a lot less work. It's doing exactly what it should be. It's OK. Um, so that was a good fix. That got us quite a bit. So you, know, you fix things, and then you keep going down the profile and saying, what, what now? Um, one little thing I found was that we were calling two variants of the not operator, the exclamation mark operator. It turned out that if you call it on a sort of undefined value, and if you call it on a Boolean, one of those cases is really fast, and the other case is a little bit less fast. Um, calling it on a Boolean is really fast because it, well, it knows it's a Boolean already, it just behaves it. Um, calling it on a type object, it has to go and delegate to the bool method to put it in Boolean context. So it's a small thing, but this was actually in a pretty tight loop. Uh, so a uh, couple of percent, not a big deal, but for a sort of for just adding equals false into the program, uh, I'll take a percent. But that wasn't really the issue. Um, so you know, we fixed that, but we're we're still kind of slow. And then eventually. After the I.O. fix, you get down to one line of the program, um, which is eating up 50% of runtime. This is always really good. When you get down to a single line and you say, yeah, this is where we spend the 50%. And this is inside the implementation of that X meta operator. And when I looked at it, and we sort of saw what's going on, um, here's what happens. Now, what I didn't tell you about X is that it's not restricted to two operations uh, on array, sorry, two arrays. You can actually do A, X, B, X, C, um, and it'll sort of do you the permutations of all three, which is actually different to A, X, B in parens, and then X, uh, C. Um, it, it actually gives you a slightly different result. So what's being done is if you think about the operation you need to do, um, if you have an arbitrary number of values and you want to get one of them, well, it's to reduce, okay? It's just a fault in functional terms. So we were creating uh, uh, this sort of reduce operator, and then we were using it here, that dollar bot there, okay? And, well, here's the thing. If we are doing the common case of an infix operator, which takes two arguments, and we have two arrays as our input, we don't need to do all of this work. We already have a function we can call with two arguments. Um, so now we do less work here, and this takes about 3% of program runtime instead of 30%. So out of these optimizations there, we now run it about half the time already. And there's still lots and lots more to sort of dig into and figure out. Um, but those three changes were you know, not that much effort, really. Uh, and they weren't things that I would necessarily have guessed were the problem. Not the I.O. one. That was a big surprise. I didn't think we were spending anything close to that much time doing I.O. The fix was simple. Um, and actually, the fix reduced the specification test time because it could output all the OKs faster, which was kind of nice. <laughs> yeah. So this profiling is really nice. Um, part of the reason it is really nice is because it also um, can dig down into NQP code as well. In fact, if you have a begin block written in Perl 6 and you're profiling the compiler, 
it can tell you how much time you spent entering that begin block and where you called it from in the compiler, uh, which is pretty nice. So we get the view across the compiler and the code as well. Um, so this is pretty handy for us. So that's how we optimize Recudo and the sort of built-ins. But what about when we get a program in from the user and we want to try and generate better code? This is what an optimizer does. So if you remember, we take your program, we make the AST, we make the world, so the, the sort of executional bits and the declarative bits, and we feed both into the optimizer. It's really important that we're feeding both in here, and uh, you'll see why in a moment. But basically its goal is to produce a better abstract syntax tree, so we have something better to execute, and it might make a better world as well. Uh, it actually tries to do things in place, really. Uh, but that's, that's basically its goal. Sort of take these two things that we have at this point, and just to give you a timelining thing, um, when we get to here, check time has already happened. So this is after check time. Uh, so basically, the optimizer can take into account anything you did at check time in the program and begin time, obviously, if it was before. Uh, an interesting side effect of this is that suppose you write a subroutine uh, and you call it from a begin block, we'll go off and compile it straight away so we can run it, but we'll actually come and recompile it when we have the rest of the program to consider. Um, so we, we may actually sort of re regenerate that in a more optimized version of it uh, later on. So how do you do optimization? Well, you always do two steps. The first step is analysis. Because you need to look at the transformation, that is the change you want to do, and say, can we do this? Is it actually safe to do? Will it actually help? Or is it likely to? If the analysis says yes, then we do the transformation. Which of these do you think is the hard part? Safe. Yeah. The work's all in the analysis. Right? The transformations tend to be dead easy. Um, you code them up in 10 minutes. The analysis is sort of hours to design and, and then you implement it and test it very carefully and, and boom. Um, so, yeah, that, that's sort of where the work goes. So what I'd like to do, uh, to finish up, is to talk a little bit about the Recudo Plus X optimizer and I want to take us through an input program, just a little one, and go through and show you how it transforms it and makes it vastly faster. So, so far it doesn't know how to do that much, but the things it knows how to do are kind of powerful. Um, so, it can do various bits of inlining. It can also do a load of compile time decision making, so it doesn't have to do any of that work at, at runtime. Um, and we'll see at the end as well, it can also use this process and analysis to actually rule out some programs that are obviously going to fail at runtime. So, here's that program. So we declare a variable i, we're going to count up to 10 million, um, we're just going to add one to it each time, and then we're just going to say it at the end. And the only thing that's really interesting to note here is that we've said this is an int, and we've used lowercase, which means this is a native integer, it's not an object. You can store this in, say, the CPU register, for example. Um, we're not going to have any sort of boxing going on there. So, or we don't need to have. I should say. So we feed this to Recudo um, without the optimizer, and it generates this huge ream of code. Um, and we look at this code and we're like, well, this really sucks. Because up here, you see it says Pulse X box int. Okay, it's actually doing a box of that. It's calling the infix uh, less than operator. So every operator in Pulse X is conceptually a multiple dispatch subroutine. That's how you do overloading. You do it by just writing into the multi-candidate. Um, here, we actually have a call to the inner block of the loop. And inside of that, well, we're boxing again, we're doing a multi-dispatch to the plus operator, and then we have to return some value from this. So, there's a load of work going on there, which, you know, if you just naively generate the code, it doesn't look good at all. So, first of all, let's deal with this slightly strange problem that it's actually generated sort of two VM-level subs. Uh, 
And the reason it's done this is because when you're compiling Pulse X, every block is conceptually a closure. And you don't know until you finish passing it that you actually maybe have something that can be reduced to a much simpler thing. So what we actually do is we take the, the sort of block and we say, does it declare any lexicals? Does it have anything in it which means this really needs to be a lexical scope of its own? And if the answer is no, then we just flatten it into the enclosing scope. So now we're down to just the one. And the blue is what we originally had. The green is the inline code for the block. Now you might be thinking, this looks a bit shorter. Where did it all go? The answer is, well, we don't need any of the prelude and postlude anymore. We can just toss them away. Um, so we sort of drag that in. Um, and we have to, you get one dollar underscore per block. So we have to be really careful that if it gets bound somewhere in this code, we go and restore the outer block. Now, it turns out it's overkill in this case, and at some point we'll implement enough analysis not to have to do this. But for now, um, the transformation is worth it, just we're adding this sort of little bit of safety code to make sure it's a safe thing to have done. So, th this is an example of these little details you have to worry about when you do this right. It's, it's really tricky to, to sort of get this right. So now our code sort of still sucks, but a little bit less. So we best deal with this multiple dispatch problem next. Because what we're looking at is a program that we think should mostly be doing arithmetic, but it's mostly spending its time doing invocations of operators. Now, there's some good, sort of good news in all of this. Um, they're lexically scoped. They're not global. So when you declare another multi-candidate, it's a lexically scoped addition to that candidate list. So the upshot of this is that we, in a given scope, we know all of the candidates that are possible. So it sounds like if we can do something about that decision-making process, then we're going to be able to do a little bit better. Uh, now, the problem we have is that Recruiter is actually really, really good at doing multiple dispatch. It's really bad at invocation speed. Okay, the invocation speed is pretty slow on the power of the end. Um, and that's sort of kind of annoying. It's actually pretty fast at doing multi-dispatch because it's got a pretty clever cache which mostly ends up just doing a few bitwise operations and then it's got an answer half the time. Um, but still, it's kind of worth not having to do. So, if we know all the possible candidates, if we know that in this scope, this is all the variants of the plus operator we have. And we know the types of the arguments, then sometimes at compile time we can say, well, this is a multiple dispatch, but we're definitely going to be calling that candidate. So if you consider this case, we know that one is an int. We know it can be a boxed or a unboxed one. We have to be a little bit careful what we do there, or we could waste a lot of time. Uh, but in this case, we know it can be a low level int. And we know that $i there is an int because it was declared as one. So we know that we're calling the infix plus operator there with two ints. So can we safely decide what to do? Well, safety is really tricky here. Um, because if you look at how multiple dispatch works in Pulse X, it does sort of a topological sort. And it gives you, um, it gives you, yeah, I have it here. It's okay. Do you want them? Yeah. Ten. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so it gives you the um, sort of groupings of candidates, which we what we call equally narrow. So this group here is all the native ones. Natives always sort narrowest. Here we have another sort of tied bunch, which take sort of various permutations of sort of different types. And then at the top, we have this any group, um, which is sort of just, well, you know, this is the fallback. It does coercion for you, um, so that if you try to add together two strings, then it actually works out because it nullifies them, and it's this thing that makes Perl feel like Perl. Um, but we actually get all of your nice sort of, sort of nice loose freedom in Perl 6, but manage to build it out of a really sort of quite statically decidable type system, uh, which is pretty nice. But anyway, we have to be really careful because if I get two arguments to a subroutine, I know that they're both of type any. That does not mean 
that I can say, oh, any, any, I can call that top candidate, because I might have been passed two ints. So we have to be really careful that we don't go and just say, oh, the types match for this one, therefore it must be the one that we call. We have to do a bit more subtle analysis than that. So here we, we know we're in the bottom group. There's no way in this lexical scope that we could have a more specific candidate. So it's a safe optimization. Now, here's the problem. We've decided we're definitely going to call a certain bit of code, but as I said, the multi-dispatch itself, that decision making, isn't where we spend time. We spend time doing the invocation. So we can actually go a step further now, because we know exactly what we're going to call, and therefore we can actually inline it. We can take the piece of code in that multi-candidate, and we can just dump it into the program itself. So now we don't have to call it, we're just going to add the two numbers together, which is what it actually does inside the operator. Now, again, this has a bunch of safety constraints, um, but if we do this, this is after these previous two optimizations, the code gets down to this. So here the infix less than operator has actually been in mind. So you can see it looks at that integer, and it does an integer comparison. There's no boxing going on there. It then puts it in Boolean context that, yeah, okay, those two lines, the bottom two green lines there are things we should be able to optimize away. But essentially, it's, it's doing something kind of same. The addition becomes really nice because we find i, we add one to it, and we store it back in the lexpan, and we're done. Um, now, there's a lot of sort of stuff that we were doing in this code, a lot of overhead, that has just sort of vanished now. And the result is that this program is 23 times faster uh, than the input program we started out with. So the nice thing is that we've still got some work to go on this year. We can actually still do a bunch more optimizations that aren't yet implemented uh, that should get us a bunch more improvement beyond this. Uh, but 23 times faster out of basically three optimizations is pretty good going. Now, while it's doing all of this analysis on your program, then it can also sometimes come up with some interesting results. Suppose I write a subroutine called uh, greet, which wants a name and a greeting. And it just says uh, greeting name, okay? So then we decide to greet Yelena, but we get very excited about this and forget to actually pass the greeting we want to use. Um, and, you know, we compile this program, but what it actually does for you is it says, well, it goes and looks at this call, and it says, what I'd like to do is know that I don't need to type check the arguments, um, because the arguments are definitely going to be safe. And in this case, well, they, they would be, apart from we're actually missing one. And what it can do, because this is a lexically scoped subroutine, and it's a declaration, and we're doing it at check after check time, which is the last time you can go and twiddle with the Lexpad declarations, we actually can say, this program will never ever work. This program is doomed to fail at runtime. We might as well not even let it get to runtime. We'll just tell you the program, and now this program won't work. Um, so this is a compile time error. Five minutes, it's okay, I'm getting that. Um, so what it does is it says, oh, call in Greek will never work with an argument of type string. Uh, actually, I expected you to give me two arguments, and they told you what they are. And you might think, does it do this with multi-dispatch too? And the, the answer is, well, in some certain more restricted cases, yes, it does. If you call a multi which has a zero argument version and a one argument version, um, and you sort of call those with, say, three arguments, it'll actually tell you at compile time, you call this multi. Um, it wants either one or two arguments, but you gave it free. Um, this program will never work. So, yeah, it, it does all of these bits of checks for you. It can only go so far. Perl still is kind of dynamic in many ways, uh, but it's nice when we can start catching these inevitable failures. It can also catch um, things like if you have something that wants an int and you pass it a string, it'll probably catch that one for you as well provided it statically knows you're passing the string. And this is where we come back, remember the diagram where I said it gets the AST and the world? 
The world has all those declarative things in it. That's why it has the info to do this. So, future work. Currently, the optimizer gets away largely with considering variables. This is the next big thing that I'm going to work on. Um, we'll be able to do a whole load more analysis. We'll be able to tell you a few more things at compile time that could never work. Um, and it should let us be able to eliminate a bunch more allocations, um, do a bunch of things that help sort of binding performance as well. Um, so there's, there's a bunch of work to do there, which could be kind of nice. Um, so that's what I'm digging into. I've been doing a lot of train journeys around Columbus recently, and I managed to design it on the train. Um, so now I need to see if it actually works in reality. Mm -hmm. It's basically abstract interpretation. Um, method inlining. So methods are really hard because they're late bound. Okay. So if you call dollar x dot foo, even if we know that x is of type say t, there might be some subtype s which is a subclass of T, which also has a foo method. So polymorphism sort of gets in our way. But we can sort of look at it heuristically and say, well, it's not very likely that there's going to be a subclass of this. And we emit code that basically tries to inline it, but emits a guard clause. So it says, here's what you should do if the type precisely matches what we expected. If it doesn't precisely match that, then you best go and read to a polymorphic method dispatch. Now, you don't always want to do this because this could get pretty costly, but if you're looking at are we in a loop, for example, when we're doing the code analysis, we statically know if we're in some kind of loop. Um, or we can sort of trace call sites to subroutines that get called in loops. And we can say, oh, this subroutine's called in a loop, so it's probably one we care about. Um, and then we can maybe sort of move this guard board outside of the loop as well. So if we have a uh, a situation where we know we can check something that gets a method called on it in the loop um, and it needs to be called each time but we, we sort of know that it's the correct type then we can maybe even pull the guard check out of the loop as well. Uh, so this could be nice. And then finally you might be saying well but I write Perl programs but I don't put any types into them. Uh, will any of this help me? And the answer is, well, yes, because every time you write, write a literal in your program, um, then we know something about its type. The other thing is that most variables in a program are actually monomorphic. They don't change type during execution a lot of the time. They can. You can have a variable in your program that starts out as a string and later gets an integer in it, but it isn't really the common case. We don't tend to do that. Uh, in fact, we a lot of programmers don't do that many assignments to the same variable in their code, if they're sort of influenced by the, the functional school of thought. So if we can sort of take the initial assignment, know its type, and then try and do a sort of proof, oh, one minute, apparently. I'll talk pretty fast. And then kind of do a proof that the program is going to keep that type, then we can probably start doing a bunch of this sort of preemptively on untyped programs as well. So looking ahead, we want to go faster. Recudo today is vastly faster than Recudo of a year ago. To give you an example, a Mandelbrot program that used to run in 16 minutes and 14 seconds now runs in 28, which is a bit of an improvement. Um, in minutes? No. <laughs> <laughs> this is where you said on the second row. 28 seconds. Thank, thanks for clarifying. Yeah, so it's, it's about 25 times faster, uh, which is pretty nice. He'll tell me that math is wrong now. So anyway, there's more work to come. Uh, stay tuned. Or if this stuff sounds really fun to hack on, then, well, to be honest, it is. Um, so feel free to come and join in. Thanks very much. Um, I probably don't have time for questions. But you, do you, have, you do, because it's 10 minutes of change time. OK, OK. Does anybody have a question? Um, I, I sometimes scribble about the slides are going to be at that blog as well, or already are. Um, I sort of want to state the question, which is, it's just so much easier. See, it's so much easier being able to do this stuff in a high level language. Because if you want to try to do this in Perl 5, you have to try and work out what the heck's going on in C, which is hard, and it's just not as clear, and it's basically not fun. <laughs> Whereas this actually looks to be fun. Yeah. Um, the second one's kind of a free joke, and at least it's only written in, um, in whatever 
was NQ Pink so so so, whereas the pole parser, of course, is officially written in Lex, Yak, Smoke, and Mirrors. And they were lost. This, <laughs> this, this is the optimizer source code, right? <laughs> It's NQP, it's Perl. That's nice. Can you read this? Yeah? And it's not very long. All of those optimizations in 430-ish lines, including loads of comments and say statements I commented out when I'm trying to debug why the hell it doesn't work. So, yeah, you can see it's, uh, it's, it's fairly sort of readable. Um, you can sort of dig in and see what it's doing. And, I, I know somebody else other than me might have to try and maintain this someday, so I've tried to be generous with the explanations. Mm -hmm. uh, That's someone as future you, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and future you always has a trouble with past you. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I really hit past me from a year or two ago. <laughs> that guy really sucked. <laughs> past me sucks too. <laughs> um,